Are there any praisers in the room? Anybody, anybody bold enough to stand up on your feet and holler in the devil's face and give God a crazy praise right there? I don't know about you, but I come to worship God this morning. I didn't come to play church. Somebody just lift your hands and give God glory right there and shout hallelujah. Somebody shout glory in the room today. Now, I got this new CD, and y'all never heard this song before, but I'm going to teach it to you anyhow. Is that all right? If you don't mind, let's just worship God. I asked West State and the choir to help me, and uh, we're going to sing it for the first time. It's the first time I'm singing it live, and we're just going to worship together. Just lift your hands. It's okay. Just lift your hands. I'm believing God that an anointing, a fresh anointing will be in the room today. As Pastor Marvin Sapp preached the word of God today, that God will move and touch in the room like never before. That people will be healed, set free, and delivered. I just need you to close your eyes and stretch your hands up and worship God. Worship God. Worship God. Just lift your hands up high. I want you to repeat after me in the balcony. Is that okay? Wave your hands and worship with me. Hey!
stretch your hands up high. I feel a fresh anointing. God is refreshing your faith. The enemy is trying to tamper with your faith. Because you're going to need this faith as you walk into the greatest year of your life. Everybody that know that this is a season of your release, I want you to lift your hands up. Give God the craziest shout of praise and shout. There was a song. There's a song, Dee Dee. There's a song. There's a song, Bishop. This is this. There's a song that when my wife went on to be with the Lord five months ago, and when I felt like I felt like I wasn't going to make it. Never thought that I could minister to myself. I put this CD on. And I had to look the enemy in the face. And I had to tell him, I said, here I am. I'm still standing. Here I am. After all I've been through, I survived. Every toil, every snare. I'm alive, I'm alive, here I am, oh, yes, I started singing this to myself, there were times when I almost gave up, and I cried, and said, Lord, it's too much. When El Shaddai, he was there all the time. By his grace, he is keeping me alive.
understand I'm alive I'm alive Here I am And this is why I made it Cause he sees He sees the tears you cry And he shares pain inside Sometimes you wonder why He allows you to go through what you go through Just know he had his hand Just know he has his hands. Just know he has his hands on you. Clap those hands and give him praise. Last recording, actually, Psalms chapter number 30. I'm so very thankful to be here. Appreciate Bishop allowing us to come and share. Let's, let's bless God for the bishop who has entered the building. Amen. Y'all can do better than that. Let's thank God for him. And as I always say, behind every great man, there's a greater woman. Let's thank God for the woman that stands with him in ministry. And just to all of you, all my father's children, I'm just glad to be here today. 30th Division of Psalms, I hope that you would rest to your feet and reverence to the reading of the Word of God. I'm an expository preacher. In other words, I like to do directly with the text upon my completion of exegeting the text to the best of my ability. I go to my seat. The writer says something I think that we need to look at, and I believe that will bless each of our lives if we just apply these principles to it. In Psalms 30, the 30th Division of Psalms, verses 1 through 5, the writer says, I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up, has not made my foes to rejoice over me. It says, O Lord my God, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. It says, O Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from the grave. Thou hast kept me alive, that I should not go down to the pit. It says, Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. Verse number five says, For his anger endureth but for a moment. In his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night. But joy coming in the morning. Bishop, I want to extrapolate my thought, if I could, from that fifth verse of Scripture, if you will. And Brother Ben, I want to look at the B clause of that text. For the writer says, profoundly, he says, a weeping may endure for a night. But joy cometh in the morning. I just want y'all to underline two words. I want y'all to underline may and cometh. Weeping may endure for a night but joy cometh in the morning. Before you take your seat, I wonder if you touch somebody to your right or to your left, look at them and smile at them. Some of y'all ain't smiled in a long time. And I want you to tell them this for me. Tell them, say, neighbor, I don't know what you're going through, but it will be all over in the morning. That's what I'm gonna talk about for a little while. It will be all over in the morning. Father, I thank you, I give you glory for this time of intimacy and fellowship. Now God, as we prepare, to delve into the Holy Writ, I pray that you give me insight and clarity into your word. A word that is neither a sounding brass nor tickling symbol, but encouraging and motivating to each and every here. We thank you in advance for the move that's about to take place in this house. And we already thank you, Lord God, for the moves that has taken place. We pray that you would bless us and make us a blessing. Anoint me afresh and anew the anointing that causes teaching and the preaching to be easy, where yokes will not be broken, because broken things can be fixed. But yokes will be destroyed under the weight of your glory. We thank you. Give you praise in Jesus' name. Everyone in this place said, Amen. Touch somebody and say, It'll be all over in the morning. Understand you, my dear brothers and my dear sisters, all of you who are part of the household of faith, indeed because of the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which has in turn made us all heirs and again joint heirs. I've learned, my beloved friends, I've learned that one of the most difficult questions to ask God in times of trouble 
one of the most difficult questions to ask God in times of trial. One of the most difficult questions to ask God in times of difficulty is the question, why? Why did this have to happen? Why must I go through what I'm going through? Why must I endure this particular trial and or test? Difficult question to ask is the question, why? But what's even more difficult to ask God is not just the question, why? But the question, why did this have to happen to me now? Out of all the times that issues could have arose in my life, out of all the times trials could have hit me, out of all of the times difficulties could have come into my existence, why in the world did you allow in this season of my life for these things to happen? Perhaps some of us, some of us have been taught that it is spiritually wrong if you will, to ask God, why must we endure certain trials? Yet, I'm reminded that God is a loving and caring father who does not abandon his children in their quest for understanding. When, if you will, the seasons of life suddenly and abruptly change, he knows that each and every one of us, that we have feelings, and he knows that the changing life circumstances often will elicit, if you will, reactions from us, some good and some the result of the natural human inclination just to find out why. Because the fact of the matter is, my beloved brothers and sisters, is that our God has not designed life to be experienced in a vacuum, but he has designed it to be experienced, if you will, in an environment where he is the only real constant. Because the truth of the matter is, is that in this life, our character is going to be often sorely tested without warning that we are going to often be at a loss of words to find, to describe our situation. So, so sometimes when we find ourselves in these particular places, we just shrug our shoulders and just say that stuff happens. Sometimes, if you will, we seek, if you will, refuge in the port of human hurt when we question, if you will, the unfairness of it all. And, and with tears rolling down our faces, we sit there lamenting over our circumstances, struggles, tests, and trials, and have pity parties and just say, why me? However, my friends, given the inescapable fact that not only must we face trials in this life, but we also must tackle everything that goes with going through or that comes with going through, it's easy for us to feel as if we're being treated unfairly. It's easy for us to feel as if we're being neglected, as if we're being uh, treated wrong, as if God has forgotten us. And many times, many times, we won't say it out loud, but we feel like giving up. I don't care how long you have been saved and I don't care how spiritual you think you are. That there is a situation that can hit you. There is a struggle that can attack you. There is something that can come into your existence that will make you question and will make you feel like giving up. I'll talk to y'all over here because they don't want to hear me. I'll say it again, that there is a thing. Now, I don't know what that thing is, but there, in every last one of our lives, there is an issue. There is a struggle. There is a situation that will hit you and will cause your knees to buckle. There is a situation that will hit you and cause tears to flow down your face on a consistent basis. There is something that you can be confronted with that will make you feel like giving up. You may not say it, but you will feel it. And, and many of us, many of us today are sitting here feeling like giving up. And, and then not only that, but we allow, if you will, our despair to lead us to depression. And there is nothing worse than allowing despair to lead you to depression. Because depression is you looking at your circumstances as if you are helpless and as if you are hopeless. And forgetting the fact that the same God that allowed the situation to come into your life is the same God that possesses the, possesses the, 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 the power to deliver you from whatever you're in right now. I wish I had a witness in this house. Again, we've allowed, if you will, our despair to lead to depression. Yet, I want to suggest to you today that God has created, if you will, a built-in purpose for each trial that he allows in your life. Even those that seem to hurt so much, God has a plan and a purpose for them. And I got to stop right here because I want you to understand, beloved brothers and sisters, that no matter what you go through in this life, that the stuff that you're dealing with is not by happenstance. It's not that God had turned his head and it just happened to you. But everything that happens in your life has been orchestrated 
orchestrated. It has been planned and it has been set up, not for your detriment, but it has been planned and set up for your betterment, if that's a word. God, in his infinite wisdom and knowledge, before he allowed it to come to your house, he made sure that it was not going to affect and infect you to the point that you would throw in your towel, give up on him, and turn around and walk away. But he wanted you to learn from the crises that you face, and not after learning from the crises that you face, he wanted you to be able to look at your situation and let the situation know that you may be in my life, but you're not going to take over my life because I serve a God that is able to do exceeding abundantly. I feel like preaching. I hope y'all praying with me. Understand, beloved brothers and sisters, that many of us have allowed our despair to lead to depression. But I want to suggest to you today that God has created a built-in purpose for each and every trial, even the little ones. And, and what I've learned is, my beloved brothers and sisters, is that God uses our trials. He uses our trials as opportunities for us to embrace our moments of greatness. For I've learned that true greatness is defined by one's desire to serve Christ in the midst of crisis and not just on the mountaintop. In other words, it's easy for me to lift up my hands and tell God, thank you, when everything in my life is going good. It's easy for me to lift up my hands and tell God, thank you, when I got a job to go to and when my house note is paid in full and when my car note is paid in full and my children are all on the honor roll. But let baby girl come in pregnant. Y'all ain't gonna talk to me. Let my son come in tripping. Let them tell me that they're downsizing on my job. Let my house go into foreclosure. Let my car get repossessed. Can you praise God in a crisis? <laughs> Because that's the true test of your character as a believer. As long as everything in your life is going good, yes, it's easy to come in here with your hands lifted up. But when all hell is breaking loose in your life, do you still got a praise on your lips to the point that you can look your circumstances in the face and say just like Job, say, though he slay me, yet will. I feel like preaching. I hope y'all praying with me. Tell somebody, tell them you got to keep on praising. You got to keep on praising them. Some of y'all ain't touch nobody. I'm looking right at you. Tell them, say, you got to keep on praising him. I don't care what the circumstances look like. You got to keep on praising him. I don't care how crazy the situation gets. You got to keep on praising him. You got to let your circumstances, your situations, and your dilemmas know that they are not in control of you. But you got a greater one on the inside of you because greater is he that's with you. I feel this all in my spirit. So I want to suggest to you that the true test of your character is not defined by you praising God where you are when things are going good. But the true test of your character is can you praise God in the midst of a crisis and not just on a mountain top. However, beloved, I've learned that the key thing that we need to remember is that God is doing something in us and through us in our trials. And I've learned, beloved, that his ultimate goal is to build a creature that is complete and mature in his relationship with his creator. And that's why the apostle, the apostle, the apostle James, the blood brother of Jesus Christ said something extremely profound. He dropped a bombshell in a letter in that day and time because James says in James 1, 2 through verse number 4, he says, brethren, count it all joy, thank you, when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith, that it worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire wanting for nothing. Notice, if you will, what he says in verse number Number two, because that's what really blessed me. James says in verse number two, he says, count it all joy when you fall and not if you fall. In other words, he lets us know emphatically and as believers that we should expect hard times. He lets us know that followers of Christ, they are not exempt from the troubles of this world. And see, that's one of the major travesties that we have in the 21st century church. Many people think and believe that just because I gave my life to Christ, that because of the simple fact that I I'm in relationship with him that my life at this specific point in time should be trouble free matter of fact that's how many of y'all thought when y'all first got saved when you first got saved I'm getting up out of this world and when I get in the church I'm not gonna have no more struggle I'm not gonna have no more trouble all I'm gonna do is come into the house of God and dance 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 all night but then you stayed in here a few days and uh, you stuck in here a few months and, and you've been in here a few years and, and then you begin to realize that many Many, thank you, Holy Ghost, are the afflictions of the righteous. But it's God who delivers us out of them all. You begin to realize that man that is born of a woman is of a few days and full of trouble. You begin to understand that I'm going to go through some stuff in this walk. So just because I'm in this walk 
and just because I'm a part of this walk doesn't mean that I'm going to be exempt from trouble but what this walk teaches me is how I'm supposed to examine and deal with my trouble I'm not supposed to fall out act out nor flip out but I'm supposed to look up because I'm supposed to look to the heels from which cometh my help in times of struggle so James starts, he starts by saying, he starts that we should expect hard times, that we should expect troubles. But, but then God tells us something in this text that blows me away. God, God doesn't promise, if you will, to take us out of our struggles, but, but he does let us know that he would be there with us in our struggles. And see, that's what, that's what I got messed up, Bishop, because when, when I found out that God doesn't promise to take me out of my struggle, but he promised that he would be with me in my struggle, I shifted my prayer. I shifted my prayer. Because I used to pray all the time, God, get me out of this. God, get me out of of this but then I shift and I stop praying get me out of it and I start saying God get in it y'all ain't gonna talk to me I'm gonna help you real fast because y'all know the story y'all know the story and I told y'all this story before like, everybody knows the story about the three Hebrew boys y'all y'all know the story y'all know the story about Shadrach Meshach and Abednego very familiar story everybody need mama preach it but but I looked at something one day that blew me away I looked at something that blew me away because the Bible declares that they bound them up in their coats their hosens their outer garments all of this stuff and they threw them into the burning fiery furnace they heated the sevens of the fire up seven times more they heated it up seven times more and the most mighty men that were in his kingdom took up Shadrach Meshach and Abednego and threw them into the midst of the burning fiery furnace but this is why I got messed up that's why I got messed up three well I got messed up at the fact that 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 Nebuchadnezzar comes to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and he says something profound notice what he says he says how many did we throw in they responded we threw in three he said wait a minute went in one minute he says I see four and the fourth one looks like the son of God but this is what messed me up he said they had no hurt and they were walking in the midst of the fire now this is why I got angry I got angry I got offended I got offended because when God delivered me I wasn't just walking in my situation I was running I was hollering I was shouting and these three Hebrew boys invokes the presence of God he's in the fire with him and all they can do is walk in the midst of the fire they could have at least been dancing in the fire they could have been leaping in the fire but they just gonna walk in the midst of the fire and God messed me up he said son you're so busy looking at it the wrong way you need to understand what's happening here I said well explain to me what's happening he said the reason why they were walking in the midst of the fire is because they had a peace that surpassed all understanding okay y'all ain't gonna talk to me but I'm gonna stay here anyway I said a peace he said yeah they had a peace that surpassed all understanding I said well wait God when they realized that they were still alive why didn't they just run out the fire and run past Nebuchadnezzar because they still in the fire he said the reason why they didn't run out because they understood that it was safer in the situation with Jesus than it is out there trying to deal with it on their own and God sent me by here to tell you stop praying take me out of it God get in it with me because it's safer in here with you than it is by myself. Touch somebody and tell him you better get him there. You better get him there. Then James, notice that James says, he also says that the trials and tests are not in our lives to destroy us, but they're in our lives to develop and strengthen us. In other words, what I'm dealing with ain't in my life to kill me. It's in my life to make me a better individual. And that's the word. That's the word God sent me all the way here to tell y'all. He sent me all the way here to tell you that when you look at your test and your trial, that you don't need to discuss with everybody and their mama your personal situation. And that's one of the major problems that I have with some of the saints in the body of Christ because you ask them how they doing and they give you a whole biography of what's going on in their lives they tell you every symptom every struggle every everything but God told me to tell you that he's given you one word for the year of 2011 and it's just one word that you need to say every time somebody asks you what's going on in your life just look at them and say better <laughs> okay y'all go catch that in a minute every time they ask you what's happening in your position in your situation don't tell them all of your business just tell them better in other words my situation might look bad but the fact of the matter is I know that better is on the way I wish you would just touch somebody and tell them better 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 in other words I don't know all your business but I don't need to know your business I speak truth to my situation and the facts say one thing but my Bible tells me another so no matter what the facts say I'm gonna say life is getting better here yeah. 
he in the Bible begins to blow me away because finally, finally, brothers and sisters, James says, James says that when you understand God's big picture, then we'll be able to rejoice. Not, not with the weak and sincere praise the Lord, but with the sense of gladness welling from up deep on the inside of us. We can lift up our hands and bless God because he has worked it out for us and in us. And that's what leads us to our text for today. Because in Psalms, in this Psalms, or in this Psalm of Thanksgiving, or rather, this Todah Psalm, David says something that's extremely profound. He, he says four words, Bishop. He says, he says, I will extol thee. That's the first set of words he says. But when I look at the text, the word I will, it's actually one word in the original Hebrew. And the word I will, it means to think. It means to meditate deeply, then to resolve. When he says I will, it means to think. It means to meditate deeply, then it means to resolve. The phrase, this phrase, if you will, it speaks of agreement and unification of the inward man working in harmony with the outward man. This phrase, I will be, it speaks conclusively and harmoniously about the totality of the inner man. It speaks to the union of the heart, the mind, the spirit, and physical frame. I will is a phrase that speaks of all of me because I may, I might, I should. It leaves a possibility for doubt and speculation to sneak in. But I will slams the door emphatically with a kind of dogmatic emph 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 emphasis. I feel like preaching. I will says that I thought about it, but I have come to the full resolve and now I have no reservation, hesitation, or procrastination about the matter. I will. Thank you. It is a phrase that speaks about all of my feelings and my focus and my faith. And it shakes hand at the table of mutual agreement and collaboration. I will says a whole lot, but David says that I am rock solid and that I am fully resolved to extol thee. But notice, if you will, he says, I will. But then he says, extol. Extol means in the Hebrew to raise or to lift up or to make a loud noise. So what David is saying here is after I have thought about it, after I have meditated on it, after I have strongly considered it, I have made up in my mind that even if I don't feel like it, I will will myself to lift up my hands and to give God praise based on my experience and my relationship with him. In other words, if he never does another thing for you, you ought to be able to look back in your history and think about some things that he has done and something on the inside of you should make you tell God, thank you even when you don't feel like thanking him. I can't get no help, but I feel like preaching. Here, the Bible begins to blow my mind because David says that after I meditated on who God was and is in my life, he says, I resolved to lift up and to bless his name. And that's, that's what we ought to be doing as believers. Every time we come into this house, there should never be a time when we have to be begged and are pumped and are primed. Our praise ought to be based upon the history that we have with the God of our salvation. If you don't remember nothing, beloved brothers and sisters, you should remember you got a track record with him. Uh, he's always been there, even when everybody and their mama walked off and left you. When it looked like you were going to succumb to your circumstances and you were going to give in to your issues, he loved you enough and looked at you and said, no, you shall not succumb, not so, because I declare and decree that if you just stand firm in me, that the rest of your days are going to be the best of your days. I wish you would just touch somebody and speak that in their lives right now. Just tell them, say, neighbor, but I don't know where you are right now but I declare and decree that the rest of your days shall be the best of your days now if you believe that put those hands together and give him a praise right now so then we need to understand, beloved, that David says that the purpose of my extolling him is because of the simple fact that I will myself to do so. But he doesn't stop there, my friends. But he gives two specific reasons in our text for the praise that he gives to God. So the first thing that you must understand is that the psalmist says that the reason why I praise him is because of my awareness that God had raised me up. Look at verse number two. It says it very clearly in verse number two. He says, oh Lord, my God. He says, I've cried unto thee and thou hast healed me. He says, oh Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from the grave. Thou hast, not, thou hast kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. Understand, beloved brothers and sisters, that the word brought up in the Hebrew aspect of the text is the same word used that means to draw a bucket from a well or from a pit. So the psalmist says here, and I love this, the psalmist says that the reason why I live 
lift him is because he has lifted me. I got to say that one more time because that was good. He says the reason why I lift him is because he has lifted me. He says that I was trapped and I was deep in a hole like water in a well. And the psalmist says that God reached way down and lifted me up out of my crises and out of my condition. And you can sit there and be all spiritual if you want to. But all of us was in some pit situations that we needed God to pull us up out of. Okay, y'all ain't got to say amen. I'm going to stay here anyway. Just think about where you've been. Think about what you came out of. Think about what he delivered you from. The truth of the matter is, is that you didn't get out that situation on your own because the stuff you was in was dark and it was deep. But aren't you glad that he didn't judge you? But even while you was yet and still in your mess, he reached way down and pulled you out of some stuff that you couldn't pull yourself out of. Aren't you glad that he didn't leave you jacked up and messed up and uncovered you, but he covered you in your darkest place and pulled you out of some situations that you could get yourself out of. Somebody in here is how to give God some praise because he pulled you out of some stuff. Just touch somebody and tell them he pulled me out. When I could not get myself out, he pulled me out. When I couldn't manipulate myself out of it, he pulled me out. When I could not get myself out, he pulled me out. I got to get up out of here. I got to get up out of here. But he starts by saying that the first reason why I give God praise is he says, I give him praise because of my awareness that he has raised me up. But secondly, beloved brothers and sisters, the second reason why he praises him, and I, I just got two points, that's all. David says that the reason why I praise God, because watch this, he has not allowed my enemies to rejoice or get the victory over me. Look at verse number one. That's good. That's good. Verse number one says it very clear, Bishop. Verse number one says, I will will extol thee. Thank you. He says, oh Lord, for thou has lifted me up and uh, has not allowed my foes uh, to rejoice over me. I've learned something, beloved brothers and sisters. I've learned, I've learned that, I've learned that real enemies, uh, that real enemies never sleep. They never sleep. They plot and they plan uh, and they scheme of ways and dream uh, of ways to bring you down. I've learned uh, that a real enemy ain't happy unless you're sad. A real enemy, uh, they love to hear the that you're crying. They, they love to hear that you're struggling. They love to hear that you're going through. I'm talking about real enemies. But that word in the Hebrew foes, I love what it means. It means one who hates. I'm going to say that one more time. That word enemies or word foes in the original text. It actually means one who hates. So what David is saying in our text is he's saying that I praise God because he has delivered me from my haters. Okay, I'm going to stay here for a minute. Because your haters want to overwhelm you your, your haters they want to obliterate you but thanks be to God that he does not leave us at the mercy of our haters but he uses them as elevators to take us to our next level that's why you need to stop hating on your haters stop trying to find out who your haters are because ain't no such thing as bad publicity let them talk about you because the more they talk about you the more curious people become about you and more but curious people become about you the more you go connect to the right folk because they want to see if what they saying is the truth so the next time a hater hates on you don't check them send them some flowers oh, y'all ain't helping me send them a card tell them thank you for every slanderous word thank you for every lie you told on me because you're not doing nothing but taking me higher I wish I had somebody that would just tell the neighbor, I thank God for my haters. I thank God for every lie. Because the more they talked about me, the closer I got to God. Because I had to pray to keep from cutting them. I had to pray to keep from popping them. I had to pray to keep from shooting them. I had to pray to keep from cussing them out. I thank God for my haters. I feel like preaching. I hope y'all pray with me. So here and then the Bible begins to blow my mind. Because David starts by saying that the reason why I praise God because first off my awareness that he has raised me up But then he says that not only do I praise him because of my awareness that he has raised me up But I also praise him because he has not allowed me to be to, to succumb to my enemies But then lastly because of his deliverance the Bible then begins to let us know that the psalmist that he calls upon the people to sing and to praise the Lord
Lord. Look at verse number four. Verse number four, the Bible begins to let us know that he tells them to sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. Understand what's happening here, beloved brothers and sisters. The Bible begins to let us know that the psalmist here in our text has interrupted reaccounting his past desperate situations with a joyful expression of testimony of his deliverance and then he invites the entire community to share in his joy in that context my then brothers and sisters verse number five if you will be in is not a promise that will always be the case or a statement about how things always will be but it is it is it is the continual testimony of the psalmist on a consistent basis that where there was once death now there is life and where there was once weeping now there is joy and where there was once night now there is morning his experiences allow him if you will to declare praise to God because of the newness brought by God and that's why and that's why he starts by telling us and he makes this declaration he says that the reason for this praise is the temporary nature of God's anger towards him he starts by saying it's only but for a moment in other words he says it's for only a night that's why he begins to blow my mind in the text because what messes me up is is that even though David if you will was living during the time if you will of the law he understood the grace of God even in the season of the law that's why he declares in our text for his anger it only endures but for a moment in other words he understood that even when he messes up God ain't gonna stay angry always David understood even though I miss it every now and then God ain't gonna stay angry all my life he loves me so much that all I got to do is is learn how to get in his presence because I can change the way he looks at me just by loving on him a little while can I close up in this house he says for his anger endureth for a moment but in his favor is life and I told y'all a little bit earlier I said the problem that I have is that a whole lot of people believe that favor is based on what you drive a whole lot of people believe that favor is based on where you live but I learned something beloved I learned that favor is not what you have but it's who has you I wish I had a witness up in here tell somebody and tell them say tell them say say neighbor favor is not what I drive but it's who has me because the Bible says for whosoever findeth life or findeth me they findeth life and obtains favor from the Lord I stop by here to tell you that when Jesus came into your life that's when you got favor I may I may I may be in the projects but I still got favor I may be on the bus but I still got favor I may be unemployed but I still got favor because favor is not what I have is who has me can I close I'm about to let y'all go so David understood that in order for him to get through this thing he had to stay connected to the God of his salvation he says his anger it endured for a moment but in his favor there is life but then he blows he blows my mind for he says weeping may endure for a night I got to stop right there because when he says weeping may endure for a night what he was saying was is that I don't have to cry over every situation because weeping may and that means possibility can I help you real fast every situation in your life doesn't deserve your tears touch somebody and tell them say neighbor you need to choose what you're gonna cry over because every situation don't deserve your tears that's why he said weeping endure for a night but joy cometh that word cometh it means it's on its
his way weeping possibility joy absolute weeping possibility joy absolute weeping possibility joy absolute weeping possibility joy absolute if you could just wait on the Lord and be of good courage he will yeah I said he will strengthen your heart is there anybody in this house that's been crying over your situation good told me to tell you season joy will wake you up in the morning just touch your mind tell them say joy is gonna wake me up joy ah uh, y'all ain't saying like y'all need it tell somebody else joy is gonna wake me up how you know because my my bishop said ain't no need to worry But the night is gonna bring Ooh, It'll be all In the moment Ooh, ain't no need to worry What tonight is gonna bring Cause it'll be all In the morning, in the morning, Woo! morning, it'll be over. In the morning, in the It's over, you can say this. Never would have made it. Never could have made it without you. I would have lost it all, yo. But now I see how you were there for me. Now I can say.
testimony, just lift up your hands and begin to thank God. Begin to give God praise. Thank you, Lord. That you brought me to this day. Thank you for every miracle you've done. For every great thing you've done. For every hater you've helped me to survive. For every blessing you've brought into my life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Because I never would have made it. Never would have been able to take it. Never would have endured it without you. Thank you, Lord. 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 What a powerful word the Lord has brought to our hearts. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy will come in the morning. I want to announce to somebody in the house today that this is your morning time. This is your morning time. You've been enduring trials, hardships, tribulations for a long time. But would you just thank God for your morning? Thank God for morning. I made it until morning. Made it until morning. Made it until morning. Hallelujah. But I also want to say to somebody who's been living in the night of sin. You've been separated from God and trying to make it on your own. Pursuing your own agenda disregarding God, his word, and his righteousness, seeking what you thought you desired and what you longed for. But all you did was bring upon yourself a dark night of sorrow, a dark night of trouble, a dark night of distress. But it's morning time. Jesus, the Son of God, who died for your sins, has arisen from the dead. And he said, I'm come that you might have life, that you might have it more abundantly. And you're not here by accident. You're here by God's providential grace. God brought you here today that you might hear the word of the Lord, that your heart might be touched and that you might turn toward the Lord and lift your heart toward him and say, Lord, I want my sins forgiven. I need a change in my life. Your life was not meant to be a life drifting on the tides of time. It was not meant to be a life like a leaf blown by the wind. God has a purpose and an objective for your life. God wants you to have joy and he wants your joy to be full. God wants your life to be successful and effective. But Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. Hallelujah. But he said, if you abide in me and my word abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. The Lord loves you as you've never been loved before. I want to pray for you today. If you would say, preacher, I need my sins forgiven. I need to know that things are well between me and God. I want to be saved. I want Jesus Christ to be Lord of my life, to take charge of my life. And listen, there is no safer place on the face of the earth than in the will of Almighty God. And God brought you here today to save you. I want to pray for you, and I'll pray for you right where you stand, right where you are. Every sin you've ever committed can be forgiven, and Jesus can become Lord and Savior of your life. While every head is bowed, every eye is closed, you know the Holy Ghost is talking to you. And if the Holy Spirit is touching and speaking to your heart, letting you know this is your time, I'll pray for you right where you stand, but I need to know that you desire prayer. If you would say, Preacher, I want my sins forgiven. I want God's help and God's power at work in my life. Just raise that hand where you stand. Lift it high. Pray for me, Preacher. Pray for me, Preacher. Lift those hands high. This is your day, your time, your moment. The Lord loves you so much. He wants to transform your life and take you to a level of life that you've never lived at before.
This is your time. This is your day. The Bible says, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And you shall be saved today. While those hands are lifted, even in the balcony, let me see those hands lifted, saying, preacher, pray for me. I need God. I need salvation. I need forgiveness. Dear Lord, I pray for those whose hands are lifted. And I pray even for those who did not lift their hands, but should have lifted their hands. I even wanted to lift their hands, but did not have the courage to do so. Dear Lord, I pray that this will be the day of the transformation, the day of the change in their lives. Lord, forgive them for their sins and set them free from those things that would drag them down and destroy their lives. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done that they might live and that they might have life let them find it today in Jesus name dear Lord I pray that they will no longer never again walk in the way of sin but that they will walk in your righteousness and in your power in the name of Jesus and everybody say this prayer after me please dear Lord I'm so sorry for all the wrong I've ever done that I did not receive you as my Lord before this day but dear Lord, I open my heart to you now. Please forgive me. Please save me. Please change my life. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he died for my sin. I believe that he arose from the dead. I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and as my Savior. And I thank you, Lord, my sins are forgiven. I thank you, Lord, I am saved. I thank you, Lord, I have 